So I'm Mark Liddell. I'm the Professor of Cell and Tissue Therapy at UCL and the Director of a facility funded by the Royal Free Hospital uh, up in North London in Belsize Park. And we have probably the largest, certainly the most diverse um, manufacturing suite for making these sort of complex medicines. And I think we're probably the only one in the country that's licensed to make uh, some cell therapies, genetically modified cell therapies, and three-dimensional tissue engineering therapies. Um, so and we do make all three. So that's, that's our, our remit. Uh, and um, we support trials, both academic trials and commercial trials across the UK and now increasingly into collaborators across Europe. Certainly we've now moved into genetically modified cells for the first time uh, and indeed only a week ago we added that to our licence to make us legally able to, to produce these. So <coughs> to put it into context, these are medicines. So when you take a cell and substantially modify it, it becomes a medicine, just like an aspirin. So the way in which you manufacture that and the controls that are applied are the same as if it were an aspirin. And you can imagine there are substantial differences in a living cell that's dividing and changing its, its, its nature all the time and a chemical product. So there's that interaction between um, uh, us as, as drug developers and the regulators as um, regulators that, that's permanently being, uh, being worked on. And, and we have a great feedback between ourselves and the regulatory authorities around the world. So in terms of difference from last year, um, one, we, we have added genetically modified cells. Two, we started a program of what are called induced pluripotent stem cells, which requires taking a, a committed mature cell from a, a, a person and reprogramming it by inserting four known genes and reprogramming it to a stem cell phenotype so that then you can program it into a different <coughs> terminal, uh, terminally differentiated cell. Uh, and we expect to go into trials with those um, in the next 18 months to two years, hopefully. So that's one big thing. And of course, the explosion in um, uh, gene-modified immunotherapies, the particular, the CAR T cells being the biggest story, I suppose, at the moment. And now we have companies asking us to help them process develop their CAR T cell products. So there's been a switch into uh, commercialization, which wasn't quite there a year ago. And it's been driven really by the CAR T phenomenon. Uh, and we now have, <coughs> we've had a, a company embedded in our facility for six years now making antiviral T cells using technology which we took into trial initially. Um, and now that model is being promulgated amongst other companies that come to us and say, uh, how do you, uh, can you help us develop our process to, uh, in, into commercialization? So that's the difference really, I suppose we've got more commercialization, um, but still a very diverse uh, uh, um, spectrum of products that we make and trials that we support. Um. So as you say, CAR T cells are the, the new kid on the block and the most exciting kid on the block. <coughs> and because of the clinical results that were seen in that first trial from, from uh, Carl Jun's group being so impressive, it's driven companies to, to suddenly take this uh, seriously. And <coughs> Five years ago, if you'd said to any big pharma company, um, you're going to be working in patient-specific autologous medicines, they would have, I think they would have laughed at you. Certainly whenever I went to conferences, the big boys on the block said, unless you can make these as an off-the-shelf product, it's not our, our marketplace. And that's changed, and CAR T cells are driving that. But there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a big gap in understanding between what a company does when it makes batches of product of a single product that would treat 10,000 people and a single product that would treat one person. And that's an expertise which is still coming out of academia, out of hospitals. And for the first time, if you think about this, if you make aspirin, you go and buy all the constituent parts to make that from um, a, a chemical supplier. For the first time ever, for these cell therapies, the hospital where the patient gets treated has to be part of the manufacturing process because you have to take the cells from the patient. In Europe and in the US, that's a licensable activity. You can't just go anywhere. You couldn't go to your GP and say, please, can you take some cells out of me? I want, you, want to give it to a company to make CAR T cells because they're not licensed to take those cells. So that's another complex thing that's being worked out e even now for companies to, to have relationships with hospitals and with specialist sites to procure the cells from the patient uh, in order to manufacture their product. 
and then the, the complexity of the delivery of these products, let alone the manufacturing side of it, really hasn't been worked out for large scale. But the thing that I'm particularly interested in and where my, I, you know, I climb on my hobby horse is the manufacturing for most of these products. And I think we can, we, we, we can so it's probably true even of the big pharmaceutical companies, really hasn't yet been optimized for treating 10,000 patients a year or 20,000 patients a year. And that's where I think there's a lot of work to be done. <coughs> so in terms of, of where we'll be in the next two, two years, five years, or 10 years, I think you're right, there will be big steps in, in, in that. Um, what worries me is that some companies, some smaller companies, are taking uh, you know, early Phase, phase one trial data from people like me who are doing early phase trials in an academic setting, seeing great results and saying, wow, that's something that we could develop. And then developing something, really not understanding how they're going to deliver that to 10,000 patients or 20,000 patients. So for the phase two trial, because they've got investors they've got to, to, to support and they've got to raise enthusiasm for their product, they go into a phase two trial very rapidly without changing the way they make the product. Now that would seem trivial until you start to think that when you finish your phase three trial, the way in which you make that product and define it has to be locked down to get your license. So if you get great phase two data and all the clinicians in that particular field are running around saying, wow, this is the greatest drug since sliced bread. We want to do this. And then the biopharma company goes, actually, we've got no way of making this product reproducibly at scale on a patient-specific basis for 10,000 or 20,000 patients. And we must be at that position before we do the phase three trial because at phase three we have to lock down the process. So then you have two years between phase two or phase three or three years or four years inventing or manufacturing or designing or, or creating a new process and you've got to prove that that makes the same product. And by that stage the field's moved on and clinicians have got bored with your products, they haven't seen it for three years, and they've learned about something really exciting and new from somebody else. And so that's what worries me about the field, that, that we race to get early data because that's how we get money in without tying down the manufacturing process, and then we'll end up with this sort of chasm of doom where everyone loses interest in the product. Yeah, so, so I'm interested in, in patient-specific products mostly, although probably one of our most exciting projects is, is, is making an off-the-shelf product, which I thought I would never ever get into. But most of the products we're interested in are patient-specific, and that is from an antiviral T-cell right the way up to a tissue-engineered larynx for our patients that are having laryngeal reconstruction. Um, <coughs> but you're right, what we need to do is better define our product so that then when we change the process, it doesn't matter because all we have to do is make certain we're making the same product. And the trouble is in many of these things, it's very difficult for us to properly define our product. So if I take a cell from your bone marrow and grow it out as a stem cell to make a, a, a reconstituted, to repair your knee, for example, um, when that cell has divided twice, is it the same as the cell that's divided four times or five times? We don't know. So what we say is, well, in our process, it must only divide three times or four times or five times, and that's the definition of our product. But we can't look at the cell. In any, you know, we, we can measure 150 different antigens on that cell, but we don't know which ones are critical to the function. So, so that's our, our challenge scientifically. How do we better define these products? Um, but our challenge technically is how do we, and, and not just technically, but from a business perspective, how do we do it and how do we persuade people to pay for it to make certain that the process that we use to make our product in the phase one trial is fit to make the product for 60,000 patients a year or 10,000 patients a year. And I think um, going back to that first question, what's different now than a year ago? Um, three weeks ago I went to a funding body um, to talk about a company that they want to set up and I said to them, if you want me to take part in this, the phase one trial manufacturing process has to be fit for the end game because we can't risk this. And they understood the argument and were willing to say, okay, fair enough, we will pay for you to get the manufacturing process sorted before you do the trial. The trial might fail and therefore you will have wasted that money. But if the trial works, it gives you that seamless run through 
to turning it into a commercial product without the risk of, of, of it not being developed.